when did this all start? How did you go from troubled guy with no real, uh, no real guidance? Like what put you on the right path? So long story short, I was uh, running with the wrong crowd. Um, it's easy to say I was a bad kid. I was a bad kid. It, it, you know, I basically was so far behind in school that there was no shot of getting caught up. And then getting into relationships with women yeah. and, uh, and girls, you know, I'm 16. Let's call it what it is. Um, and just being kind of a playboy, you know, I'm, I'm dating this girl, but then I would cheat on her. And then this girl would think I'm exclusive. Then I, there's a lot of and what it was is it was just a complete lack of integrity. So I run away for two weeks. I run away over two weeks. Um, you know, five days here, come home for a day. My mom's devastated. Um, and then, uh, I run away again cause I feel guilty and all the other shit. So finally I come home 10 30, 11 and I'm sitting in my bedroom on this chair and my mom walks down the hallway and just walks into the room, gives me a hug and I hear her whimper a little bit. And again, if I processed <laughs> that emotion, I think um, I would have experienced a lot of pain. So I was cold to it, but I was also very confused by it. I'm like, why is she, why is she so emotional? Why is she so lovey dovey when she should be wanting to whoop my fucking ass? Yeah. So, so I go to bed and uh, I wake up to um, two men, one holding my right arm with both arms and one holding my left arm with both arms. And I remember the, the, the fear that was flying through my body and adrenaline, like, what the fuck? Like half it was, am I dreaming? Am I awake? And as they held me and said, got me to come to and calm down, they were like, hey, they were really candid. Hey, we're taking you to school in Mexico or this school for two months and uh, um, you need to get dressed. And I'm just like, what the? fuck like where am I and, and then you know there was a little bit of resistance in me and they immediately with energy you need to get dressed and I was like okay I'll get dressed did you ever put two and two mom's emotion not yet okay not yet and you got to be really you got to be understanding of how I'm describing it great question but you got me like three in the morning I'm asleep I 303 I'm, I'm I'm being told to get ready and these two guys are bullying me into getting dressed and then three, you know, now I've got a new batch of information. I'm going away. And now I've got a new batch of information. I'm going away for X amount of time. Um, and then I'm not even, what's funny, Danny, great question. I'm not even, I don't even, I'm wondering, I'm not even wondering where my mom is. I'm just <laughs> listening to these guys. So I'm thinking, I don't know what I was processing. They were just like, get in the car. You're going away um, for a short amount of time. And I'm like, well, do I need this? They're like, you don't need that. They just kept stripping me of anything that I needed. Do you want my? You don't need your watch. You don't. You need your. You don't need your chain. You need shoes, pants, and a jacket. And so they say, sit down on the bed. So I sit down on the bed, and uh, they're like, you need to wear these. And they just toss them at me. I'm like, what the fuck? These are knee braces. So they put me in knee braces, and uh, I'm still kind of like not all there. I can't even really recollect this in, in extreme vivid detail, but they put me in these knee braces. Long story short, I somehow am willing to put them on. And today it's kind of hard to put myself in, in that place, but I was a fucking 16 year old punk kid <laughs> that had just woken up that has these two extremely dominant figures telling me to do X, Y, Z. And what else am I going to do? I fucking did it. So they walk, they walk me down the hallway. I don't remember the stairs. I don't All I remember is having to back my ass into the car, the backseat of the car using my, because of the braces? Yeah, because of the braces, because I couldn't sit straight. Because of the speed your father gave you? <laughs> yeah. Come to find out that that was what that was about, is, is that the, the, they, they give my mom a checklist. Is your son aggressive? Is he angry? Is he depressed? Is he going to kill himself? Is he going to jump off the roof? Um, can he run fast? Do we need to worry about him running away? And so you check all the boxes. And so one of the things was bring the knee braces, and that way it'd take me a long-ass time <laughs> yeah. to unwrap the knee braces to run. But I never even thought about it. I mean, I just sat in the back and I kind of, you kind of come to a place where you just know it's over. Yeah. It's kind of like, probably like we just watched Andrew Tate's video yeah. walking out, you know, well, why didn't Andrew run? Why didn't he jump over the fence? 
it, it came know, to. It came to. You got to pay the piper. You got to pay the piper, <laughs> yeah. and that's where I was at with it. I just knew I was fucking up. I knew the running away had to be painful for my mom. Something that I found really interesting after the whole experience, and even to this day, and as a parent today, and you've got to relate with me on this because you're so close to my children, is think how much strength that took for my mom to go mental strength to admit I am unable to raise my own children child. Yeah. I am unable to raise my own child and the whole, my entire sphere of influence, social circle has to know that that, that it had to be it, tough. It's a big <laughs> pill to swallow. You know, I failed. I <laughs> failed at parenting. The one thing that it was supposed to come to me naturally supposed to come to me instinctually I 100% failed at it yeah and that's where my kids at because I failed so I had a lot of respect for my mom to be willing to swallow that pill a lot of parents aren't willing to swallow that pill and aren't willing to go and get help and then they just the, the problem child is exasperated but th I can't speak on that I can only speak on myself so um my mom had the ability to do that. So these guys throw me in the back of this car, get me to McCarran Airport. I walk through the airport wobbling. I get onto the airplane. A lot of this is still a fog even to this day. I get on the airplane. Remember, they put me on the window seat intentionally. Everybody's looking at me on the airplane like, this is fucking weird. And uh, um, they fly me to San Diego. We get out. Again, this is very vague. Um, I don't know how we went from the plane to a rental car, but we did. And then I'm back to see the car. And then I remember driving. I never been deep into Mexico. Like I'd understood a, a version of Tijuana, but never truly Mexico. So in my brain, Mexico is like, you know, dirt roads and donkeys and, and yeah. And light posts that are lit with a <laughs> fucking candle, you know, like I didn't understand that it was a totally civilized country. So I'm driving through and I'm like, Holy fuck, this is Mexico. Like, this is not what I was thinking. And I started asking him questions. Cause I'm like, I'm in fucking Mexico. Like Two hours after I, you know, four in the morning now, five and a half well, in the morning. Any now. plan of escaping? Oh is man, out. yeah, it was gone. It was <laughs> gone. And and what they kept selling me to keep me calm was that I was there for a short period of time. And I remember there was some round of bad kids that we had interacted with that I was like, it's probably better if I'm just not there for the if things cool off. So I kept hanging my hat on that on my in my mind in my own mind. So we roll up to these big doors, these big orange doors. The paint was orange. These big wooden orange doors are probably 17 to 18 feet tall. You could fit a bus through it. And two Hispanic gentlemen, Mexican gentlemen, um, jump out, unlock the door, and we drive into the gates. And then I just start seeing lines of kids all wearing uniforms. And I'm like, fuck. <laughs> I'm, I'm in Ensenada, Mexico, and I still didn't quite process it. But so I go to, um, you know, I got to start, go, I tap into my ability to start connecting with people and trying to be friends with people and see if I can swagger my way through this problem. And I'm like, hey, uh, can I use the restroom? And they're like, yeah, yeah, it's fine. Because I was still just being put in. And obviously I just got there, so they were yeah. compassionate to that. And uh, so they call on the radio in, in, in Spanish, come come grab this kid. He needs to go to the restroom. So this guy walks through the door, grabs me with another older kid in a uniform, but nobody's talking to me. One, the guy that worked there didn't speak English. And two, the kid, once you learn the system, you're not allowed to talk to new kids. So it was like I was just taken by these two people that wouldn't talk. And they're like, come with me. And then we cross through the courtyard and they open the key they use a key to open a door i'm like why is there so many fucking keys to open doors <laughs> they want to keep you in there. yeah i'm like now that now i'm starting to process that this is a lockdown facility i'm like fuck so i walk in and then i'm in the long hallway as an easy representation and there's glass everywhere you could basically see everywhere from any stand any vantage point and that was intentional and i could see into the classroom and i'm like fuck there's a lot of kids here i'm like that's a lot of bodies and then, I, and then I walk into the bathroom to the right, and I go to the bathroom, I get back out, I'm washing my hands. And I look to the kid next to me, and I'm like, well, I might as well start making friends, because I don't, I don't know what else to do. And I go, hey, what, what, what is this place? And he looks at me, and he won't even respond, because you couldn't talk to the new kids without permission. So I'm like, fuck. I'm like, but he yeah. looked at you. Oh, he looked. He would, dude. Yeah, it was like you and I, right? <laughs> hey, what the fuck are we here for? What did he say with his mm -hmm. eyes? 
I can't talk to you. <laughs> I don't know if I was able to recall that, you know, in vivid detail to this day, but this kid looked at me and looked away. And, uh, I'm like, I'm in a fucking heap of shit. Okay. So I get back now they go, okay, you're, you're here and, uh, we need to go get you checked in. So they take me upstairs, they sit me down and they're like, we got to shave your head. And I'm like, what? But now I'm like in a very big space. What ends up happening, people think I'm going to be tough and fucking fight through it. You are now in a, you are out of control. Control has left you and you know that control has left you. And um, you have, your best option is to abide. So I remember they sit me down, they shave my head and then um, give me a uniform. And now I'm starting to like, cause I'm like, I can live out my hair. Now a uniform. And I was starting to get agitated. I'm starting to have to tap into my next tier of resources, which is just anger because yeah. it's worked for me in the past. But I'm not there yet, but I'm feeling it. And then I, this guy walks up, his name is Miguel. And I, and I go, how long am I here for? And he goes, on average, it's 16 months. Now they're honest. Right. <laughs> well, the, the workers there hit you with the reality. The escorts are f feeding you la-la land so that you don't panic. Yeah. I'm like, anybody can absorb a month, two months. But when this guy said 16 months, I lost it. And I was like, fuck you. Fuck this place. Fuck everybody. My mom does not. This is how delusional I was as a kid. Like, my mom didn't know that's how long yeah. it was going to take for me to get out of there. 16 months. I'm like, she didn't fucking sign up for this. No fucking way. Get her on the phone. <laughs> like, fuck you. We're not getting her on the phone. So I start going erratic. Get on the phone. This isn't what she signed up for. You guys are fucking delusional. I, I don't even know what I was saying. I was probably talking like a little gangster. I'm trying to be tough. So then they could see that my energy is, has, has escalated to a point where I'm going to probably become physical with somebody. So they get on the radio. Codio Rojo. Arturo Codio Rojo. Arturo Codio Rojo. Arturo Code Red. This fucking seven foot big motherfucker <laughs> comes walking in the room, doesn't look at me, doesn't acknowledge me, nothing. Fucking grabs me by the back of my shirt. I don't even know what he grabbed me by. But he grabbed me from the back of my body, slams me down on the ground, grabs me, pulls my head up, slams my fucking chin on it, grabs my legs, pulls them behind me, and fucking holds me in a position like this until I'm calmed down. And, okay, some kids respond to that with more aggression dude i was humbled so quickly <laughs> oh when you feel man strength yeah I, when i felt man strength on me dude i was like okay okay sorry okay i need to be more diplomatic about this because that ain't working that didn't work well, you're intelligent yeah <laughs> right that maybe that's what that stems yeah. from and i wasn't i was i was arguably this pretty soft kid but um so i sat i sat in that position i believe until i uh for some amount of time, but enough time to calm me down. But then they came in and they explained to me, okay, now you're in what we call RR, which is uh, r, r That's their rest and relaxation room. Well, what is included in that rest and relaxation is that um, in order to get out now, because I was just there to be um, put into the system yeah. in this room. But because I acted out, now I qualify for r r And r r is that um, you've got to do the domino or the piece of paper thing for four hours and then you get to go to worksheets and the piece of paper thing the piece of paper which is holding the paper or the domino on the wall with your nose or your forehead which really it's a combination because over time your nose would fucking it really starts to hurt so you kind of just do this <laughs> what if you dropped it you have to start over so if you're at three hours and 58 minutes <laughs> Yeah, and there was there. Be realistic. You could say, "Hey, can I take a three minute break?" But okay. you had it had to be conscious. It wasn't. It, yeah, dude, they were fucking extreme over there. If you, you know, that's a very mild tactic. If you had a fever and you were totally following the rules, they'd fucking throw you in a shower and turn the cold water on. And if you resisted, they'd fucking stand in front of the shower door. <laughs> and you just sit there and be peddled with like freezing ass cold water. Break a fever. It broke a fever. Um, what were some of the other things? Some kids would say, I'm not going to eat. Fuck you. I'll just self-inflict. And I remember hearing this fucking relatively heavy kid. I, I saw him go up the circle. Remember I was telling you about the glass. So you could yeah. see him going up to the third floor, which everything was on the third floor because then if the kid tried to run, the, the facility had time to um, come to the staircase to prevent you from getting down. They wouldn't obviously do it on the first floor because now you can get out quickly. 
So everything that bad happened happened on the third floor. Well, all these built this whole building was built out of concrete. So I hear through the grapevine rumors that the new kid just won't eat. And that's why he hasn't been introduced into his family yet. So after R and R, then worksheets, you go into your family, which my family was called the Noble family. And uh, going back to the universe, even to this day, it just seems to always want to be good to me. And I think that, that at that age, it was my mom manifesting that goodness into my life because I actually thought my mom said, which one is the best family? I want my son in that one. Nope. Just by chance, I got put there. And nice. coincidentally, it was the best family. So I started to learn about like how the universe is taking care of me around that time. But um, so back to this kid that wouldn't eat and hadn't got introduced into his family. Um I hear, I hear them fighting. I hear this guy, Jason, and this kid screaming back and forth. And all you can hear is mumbling because I'm in the classroom and they're up on the third floor because this was a hotel um, to give you kind of some perspective of what the layout was like. And then you just hear, <laughs> <laughs> so you can assume what happened. Yeah. Okay. And then I see the kid coming down and he's bleeding. Oh, shit. Sure enough, they ship that kid off to fucking high impact which high impact was if the tactics in the school weren't working, which was the domino, the worksheets, the fitness, all the other things. Arturo. The Arturo. <laughs> yeah. They'd send you to high impact. And high impact, I'll, I'll just go through it briefly because I want to get back into what the point of the program was. But um, so if you're like, fuck you, 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 and they keep trying to do all this stuff where they'll slam you because that kid got slammed. Yeah. I'm sure he got back up, which is how they got into a fight. He probably swung on him. And then the other guy, you're in Mexico. You got to remember this. One, you, 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 you signed up 48% of your parental rights to the school and you're in Mexico. Like these, the people that ran this place, they'd square up. Yeah, like I mean, you hit me, let's go, dude, and they'd fucking pop you. And I knew that that kid got popped by this crazy motherfucker named Jason, that because his nose is all blown up. So that kid goes to high impact. High impact basically is tucked up way in the top hills of Ensenada, Mexico. Oh, so you leave the facility? Oh yeah. Oh, see, I didn't know that. I thought it was in the facility. No, 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 no. no. So you never actually got to see what it looked like. You just heard the stories. And yeah. when the kids came back, dude, this kid was probably 130 pounds overweight. You know, at whatever weight he was, he was probably 100 pounds overweight, minimum. This kid came back skinnier than me <laughs> in like three weeks, like shedded the weight overnight. And what the system is over there is you get you get there and you've got this horse track, for example, a visual horse track, and you're assigned 5,000 laps. You go, here you go. Welcome to High Impact. That's where you sleep underneath that fucking gazebo. Here's a blanket. And I don't even think you get a pillow. Here's a cup for water. And every night you eat rice and, and, and chicken. And my understanding is that the, the kids would come back and they'd tell us that they were so hungry that they would crack the bones and suck the marrow out and all kinds of crazy shit. And so you if you stood in, you st so you got like 5,000 laps. So you'd wake up at 6 a.m. and you'd start walking your laps. If you wanted to get out there quickly, you'd run your laps. If you wanted to get out there moderately quick, you'd walk and run your laps. You'd jog your laps. you get the point. It's how you lose 100 pounds in three weeks. Right. So the... Uh, and, it, and then if you looked at a line, you got like 150 laps. Like it was extreme discipline and there was nowhere to go. If you wanted to run, you were just going to run out in the middle of the forest, like out in the middle of whatever. I don't even know what it was. Again, I didn't know. So anyway, they would come back and you would see these kids feet. They were black, black, the toenails, black, long hair, long facial hair, long, skinny as a, as, as a rail. And they did that on purpose. They wouldn't let these kids get cleaned up. They would bring them back right through the main doors. I could see those doors now and put them right in the family. That sends a message. Sent a message to the whole family that, that I don't want to go to high impact. 